Hello, my name is Nikita Braginski. I am a PhD candidate at uh, Berlin Humboldt University Media Theory Department and I will be speaking about the game. The game as part of the digital culture and not necessarily the game that everyone thinks about when, when, when you speak about digital culture like a uh, computer game. I will be speaking about traditional games and how they are related to, to the technology that uh, we use today as part of our everyday uh, digital experience. Um, so the game is part of the digital culture and uh, I will be also speaking about the parallels between the structure of some um, games which um, are not computer games as I have said and the technological structure of today's hardware and software and I will also be speaking about the different dic difficulties uh, that we humans and um, computers also have in solving complex mathematical problems. I would like to start with a, a, a story uh, uh, many of you have heard of. In 1997, the specialized uh, chess computer Deep Blue has famously won against the top human player of that time, Kasparov, who was a, a, a hero in Russia when I was a child. And uh, this already happened in 1997. And uh, I'm sorry to say that, but today, uh, even smartphones are able uh, to win against top human chess players. So this is one part of the situation. But on the other hand, there is a famous um, Asian game uh, called Go. It's uh, pretty old and uh, for humans it's comparable in complexity. So it's comparable um, and, um, um, and difficulty. But for computers it's much more complex to play than chess. So uh, we also have this situation that even today uh, there are no computers that are able to play Go at, uh, uh, at a level comparable, anywhere comparable to human players, professional human players. So to understand this special condition of our time, we have to look at the history of modern algorithmic media and um, especially about levels of complexity. There are different levels of complexity for humans and for computers in solving problems. I will be talking about that, uh, about the efficiency of algorithms and also about the limited limited ability of humans to recognize hidden and complex order, which is the same as pseudo-randomness. So, and now when we look at the, um, what I'm going to speak about, the game, the game is situated exactly at this highly productive edge where all these phenomena converge. Um, one um, story that I would like to speak about is that in, 1990, in 1962, two Dutch researchers, and I hope uh, I'm pronouncing their names uh, correctly, Dekas and uh, Duvestein, they have published an article in which they describe their successful attempt at solving a combinatorial problem. The problem uh, is that um, a chess board, an uh, imaginary chess board of course, has been dissected uh, into tiles. It has been randomly um, 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 tiled 
And so the computer had uh, the task to uh, put the chess board uh, back together. Now, uh, they have been successful. They have been successful, but they were able to solve this problem only by testing each and every combination of the tiles. And this is, of course, what many are thinking of when they hear uh, about computer solving problems. Now there's a problem to this. This way to find a solution very often tends to require impossible amounts of memory and computing power. This is due to the so-called combinatorial explosion. The combinatorial explosion is a, is a uh, when you uh, have, for example, only 10 elements, you can put them in different orders in more than 3 million diff different ways. So there are more than 3 million different ways to put only 10 millions in different order. This is uh, 10 factorial. Now imagine, uh, uh, for example, a much larger uh, Go board. There are so many possibilities uh, that uh, this becomes a real problem for the computer to solve. Well, this has been known for hundreds of years, but uh, uh, with the advent of the new medium, of the new algorithmically um, working computer, this, uh, it seems to me this uh, has been somehow forgotten. So people were so enthusiastic about uh, the, the new possibilities that they did not think about the problems uh, which are connected to this combinatorial explosion. Now, now, uh, today, this belief in the omnipotence of the algorithmic combination of basic arithmetic operation has largely waned. And this uh, stubborn method of successfully testing all possibilities has earned the, the somewhat dismissive name of uh, brute force. Now, th th these were the problems of the computers. Now let's look at the problems uh, which arise for us humans when we have to solve comparable problems. Um, and um, one of the topics that I analyze, uh, currently analyze as part of my ongoing PhD dissertation project is a process uh, that is used to generate pseudo-random numbers called LFSR, linear feedback shift register. This is a, is, is a really a very simple uh, process in which binary numbers are being shifted stepwise and then combined using uh, logic operators. Now, the fact that this stream of uh, numbers is called random or pseudo-random at all is already revealing because this is not random, this is order. It's completely deterministic and uh, as such an example of order yet. This order is so complex that we humans are not able to perceive it and therefore call it pseudo-randomness. It lies beyond the boundaries of our cognition. We perceive it as random, at least as unpredictable. Now let's look at this LFSR process uh, in more detail. It uh, consists, as I have said, uh, of stepwise shifting of binary numbers. Now the stepwise shift is something that uh, we can see in a surprising number of domains. For example, the uh, CPU, the processor which is inside every modern uh, piece of digital equipment, the CPU always uh, or normally 
has dedicated uh, operators to shift numbers in the same way. To shift numbers uh, because in the binary domain this equals to their um, um, multiplication or division by two, which is a basic mathematical operation that has to be done uh, very often. Uh, but also, when we look at two of the very popular games of the 1980s, the Tetris game and the Rubik's Cube. Uh, in the Tetris game, there is, uh, of course, this um, logic of uh, stepwise shifting horizontally and uh, vertically, uh, which is a basic part of the, of the playing, um, of the play. But uh, in the Rubik's Cube, we can see the same logic. You can also only shift parts of the Rubik's Cube by the specified amount of degrees. Of course, you can shift it by only one degrees. But this is an operation that is not allowed in this game. You have to shift um, a level on a Rubik's Cube by, say, 90 degrees in order to this, for this in order to be uh, an allowed operation. So this is also a stepwise shift. Um, and I think this, uh, this can be seen uh, really in a lo lot of uh, domains today. Even the oldest surviving game that I know of, the so-called Royal Game of Ur, um, which is four and a half thousand years old and it has been unearthed during excavations in the Mesopotamian town Ur. Even this game is based on this idea of stepwise shift, not continuous. Because uh, you, in this game you have, you have a board with squares, uh, and you can only shift your counter from one square to another square. You cannot put your counter in between. Uh, in the same way as you cannot only turn uh, a level on your Rubik's Cube by only one degree. Well, it seems that this cultural technique of stepwise shift, of discretization in regard to the operational model with which a game is played, this cultural technique has until, until today not seen the interest and concern that it deserves. For example, the now ubiquitous discretization of signals, like the audio and video signals, and this recording, which um, you are watching currently. Even uh, this discretization, which is a prerequisite for the digitization, is anticipated in this ancient example of discrete modeling of continuous movement in the royal game of war. So coming back to the competition between man and machine. Well, uh, I think we can be glad that we, at least some of us, not me, but some of us, are still better at recognizing complex order in mathematical games like the game of Go. So, let's not concentrate on the shortcomings of our historically shaped cognition. Instead, let's use it to study our new situation where we are surrounded by algorithmically processing tools well, at least that's what I am going to do in my dissertation. Thank you for watching.